On the 3rd of October, 2020, Jujutsu Kaisen began airing its first season. A handful of weeks later, my friends urged me to watch it. My response back then? Why would I waste my time watching mid? While calling shows, movies, or books that I haven't read or seen, mid is my favorite pastime, little did I know that my decision to finally give in and actually watch Jujutsu Kaisen would have such a profound impact on my life only a couple of years later. Jujutsu Kaisen is good. I love the story, the characters, its power system, and Kege's writing as a whole. And while I've reviewed both Hidden Inventory and the Shibuya arc in their own respective videos, I've yet to cover the first season. So that's what we're doing today. And like everything else, it all starts with Episode 1. When I initially watched this episode, I remember being moderately impressed. I'd been spoiled by shows like Trigun or Kawe Bebop and Attack on Titan when it comes to outstanding first episodes, but I pressed on. The humor was okay, but I didn't really care much about anyone outside of Yuji. The classmates and school setting felt like afterthoughts and with hindsight of future events, we know that it's really all they amount to even now. Regardless, on my rewatch it was a little different. With knowledge of coming plot points, I actively sat down and watched this episode, jotting down notes while looking like that one DiCaprio meme every few minutes. Yuji and his grandfather have a couple of very important conversations that I didn't really clock on my first viewing. It's both the phone call and the hospital scenes that really get my mind going. What exactly does Wasuke know? Spoilers for the manga, skip here to avoid. In chapter 152, we find out that Kenjaku had taken over the body of Yuji's mother to give birth to Yuji. Wasuke warns his son, Jin, that Kaori, or Kenjaku in this case, is dangerous. And while unable to convince his son to stay away, it feels like he has tried to make up for that with Yuji. The first conversation the two have over the phone is Wasuke yelling at Yuji to essentially live a normal life. Go to school, take up a club, make friends. Whether this is his way of keeping Yuji away from the world of Jujutsu, or perhaps making it so that Yuji can experience normalcy for as long as possible before the inevitable, remains to be seen even now. The second conversation, however, kind of points towards the latter. In the hospital, Wasuke tries telling Yuji about his parents, but with Yuji not wanting any of it, he scoffs and reclines back into his bed, turning away from Yuji and giving him something even more important, for better or for worse. You're a strong kid, so help people. Don't expect any gratitude in return, and when you die, do so surrounded by people. On one hand, helping people becomes an unshakable core of Yuji's character. On the other hand, in Shibuya, those words become a curse as Yuji's body is taken over by Sukuna, and unable to do anything, thousands die by his hands. The other two quotes are also notable, as they come up from two different characters later on, Megumi during the detention center and Gojo 2 Megumi during the final few episodes of the season. Helping people while expecting no gratitude or recognition is both the path and burden that sorcerers must bear, and continuing to do so until the day that they die, alone, just as Gojo tells Megumi. Whether Wasuke was a sorcerer himself, or simply preparing Yuji for what was to come, it's a conversation that I really hope Gege revisits in the future. On my first watch, this was something I listened to and then moved on with my life, but with added context now, it's taken up most of the time in the video so far. The rest of the episode is good. I liked Megumi and Yuji's dynamic early on, and this one sequence in particular had me excited on my first watch. There will be times where you come across something, and you can just naturally intuit that it's good for some reason. And this short running sequence was a small glimpse into just what Sungwoo Park was cooking this season. The other standout moment has to undoubtedly be Sukuna. Awakened from his thousand year slumber, the king of curses, and the name of episode 1, Ryoman Sukuna makes his debut. Looking back at it, Sukuna was much more unhinged on his first appearance. With what we know of his character now, him popping out and just fiending for women and children is definitely a little jarring. But still, arguably one of the most iconic villains in recent times is here, and he's ready to shred the story asunder. On the first watch, 6.5 out of 10, 7 on the rewatch. Episode 2 The previous episode was solid. It had enough meat on its bones to get the theory crafting muscles going, some solid action, and decent comedy that didn't feel overly forced. Episode 2, however, takes the first one's lunch money every day at 8.30 a.m. sharp, right in front of the cafeteria door while everyone else is watching. The action is elevated, the emotional impact of Yuji coming to terms with the death of his grandfather hits hard, the top-notch music begins rearing its head, and of course, Gojo Satoru. Gojo is undoubtedly one of the most popular manga and anime characters of today. I might have called him a Kakashi clone back when I first watched the show, but I quickly got backhanded from the sheer aura and swagger of this man. While Kakashi was incredibly powerful in part 1, he wasn't infallible. Gojo, on the other hand, is the pinnacle of his verse and he knows it. His attitude is aloof and irritating, but no one can deny that it isn't warranted. The strongest sorcerer in history has just reincarnated, and the first thing Gojo does is fight him. 
sorry, completely embarrasses him to show off in front of his student Megumi. This short scuffle between the two is what got me hooked into the first place. Song Woo Park, director of Jujutsu Kaisen Season 1 and the movie, is an action savant. His direction is always dynamic, and trust me, we'll be singing his praises throughout. While he's not the one to personally animate Gojo vs. Sukuna, it still looks amazing. I wonder why. Oh, it's Kichiro Watanabe, of course it's fu- Anyone that's familiar with my videos knows how much I shill for Watanabe, and you can't tell me I'm wrong on this. While this isn't my favorite cut he's done, I just love how fluid all of it is. From the clothing to the smears and just the snappiness of the motion, you get the picture. My only complaint, and it's one I share with my past self, I just wish it was a little longer. I'd actually seen a portion of this fight on Twitter, I think, and I was like, okay, that's cool, I can't wait to see the full extended, you know, three, five minute fight. Only to be greeted by a, what, 30 second scuffle? So yeah, I really wish it was a little longer. With a fight concluding and Yuji taking over once more, Gojo knocks him out before we return to the present. Oh yeah, we were in a flashback, forgot to mention that. Having unknowingly become a vessel for Sukuna, Yuji is set for execution. However, with him being a generational talent, his sentence is suspended on the condition that he ingests all of Sukuna's remaining fingers before he gets executed. How kind. And with that, any hope Wasuke might have had for Yuji to live a normal life vanishes. Just like his body in the creep, Yuji doesn't really have much of a choice. Either die now, or die later. But to him, one option gives him agency, and with a world void of Sukuna in his fingers meaning less people die, he consumes the second finger one tenth of the way there. I'd be remiss not to talk about the elephant in the room, Gojo's confidence in defeating the King of Curses. While it's been memed to hell and back by now, watching this for the first time was exciting. I immediately clocked what Gege was trying to set up back then. Not just their fight, but rather their respective positions on the pecking order. For the foreseeable future, Gojo and Sukuna stand heads and shoulders above everyone else, so having one of those two titans proclaim their guaranteed victory just like that is an incredibly effective way to build up hype and anticipation. 10 out of 10. Yaga vs Yuji. While it doesn't take up too much time, I quite like this section on my rewatch. It's interesting to see the seeds of Yuji's cog mentality begin to grow. Yaga directly calls Yuji out for only wanting to become a sorcerer because of the final words of his grandfather, despite the ugliness that comes from being a sorcerer. Much later in the manga, a character tells Yuji this. When one sorcerer asks another for help, it's basically asking, please risk your life with me. It's cool to see how consistent Gege can be as a writer, and it's a good point that Yaga brings up. The answer Yuji gives to him is stupid. While altruistic in nature, it isn't exactly what Yuji himself is thinking. His real reason, and the one that Yaga helps him see, is that he's the only one capable of bringing a permanent end to Sukuna, thus eradicating a great source of evil from the world. It's only after Yuji gives this answer that Yaga accepts him into the school. 8 out of 10 on my first watch, 8.5 today. Episode 3 If you had asked me prior to this video to try and recall this episode, I would have folded almost immediately. Truth be told, this episode is one that completely had escaped my memory on account of it being kind of mid. On my rewatch though, it wasn't all that different, but I did gain a little bit more appreciation for it. Right off the bat, this episode is undeniably much funnier and lightharder than the previous two, and while the latter dealt with heavier subjects, the comedic moments sprinkled throughout just were not as funny, to me at least. I love how goofy and carefree Yuji is here as they wait for Nobara, eating popcorn and crepes as well as wearing a pair of silly glasses, all the while making fun of Nobara for being completely embarrassing. Yuji is so unintentionally funny, and it really is just my kind of humor. Speaking of Nobara, Nobara Kugisaki is the third and final first year. Having been accepted a little earlier than Yuji, she comes to Tokyo from the countryside and immediately picks a fight with a modeling scout, Yuji, and Megumi. I find it insanely funny how her first impression of Yuji is that he looks like a potato and that she's incredibly disappointed that it always ends up like this, only for them to match energy one to one later on. At least, that's until the mission starts. Nobara becomes noticeably more serious and even a little annoyed at Yuji's lack of experience. She comes off as mean-spirited and even a bit of a bitch. bitch. The main focus of the episode, Yuji and Nobara's sweep of the building, is alright. Once again, I love how silly Yuji is, taking the mission super seriously while also somehow being utterly unserious with the constant shahs and shahs. Sh Meanwhile, Nobara is all business. Wanting to prove that she belongs in Tokyo and not the boonies, she's quick to get this mission done and wants nothing to do with Yuji's antics. We get a little bit of action, nothing too spectacular compared to the feast we got in the previous episodes, but a piece of Nobara's backstory is given to us, a piece which, trust me, will be revisited in a bit of an unsavory episode. If I had to say what my biggest issue with this episode was, it has to be the scale of it all in the grand scheme of things. 
Jujutsu Kaisen doesn't really lean into the small fry conniving curses all that much after this. While it works in the context of this episode and it's neat seeing a weak curse really push Nobara, not physically but rather mentally, our cast gets naturally stronger as the story progresses. The opponents they end up facing are either human sorcerers or incredibly powerful curses that don't really bear much resemblance to those of the early episodes. It's kind of like how in Naruto we go from relatively small and grounded abilities to giant kaijus and beyond only a handful of chapters later. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does make it hard to take this little guy seriously when the level of curses explodes only an episode later, and we curses that prey on human emotions become practically extinct. I think it's why I found this episode a little underwhelming when I first watched it, because off rip, Nobara is an interesting character, but her one moment to shine and look cool is killing this guy. It doesn't exactly leave a strong impression. Thankfully this does get remedied later on, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The biggest strength of this episode however, at least to me, has got to be the final couple of minutes. As the gang finishes up sending the kid off, they get to share a nice moment where everyone is having fun. Especially Yuji only for us to cut to black as Ichiji narrates the following. Due to the emergency nature, three Jujutsu Tech first years were dispatched to the scene. One of them died. It's a very ominous setup, and funnily enough, wasn't really that planned out by Gege, but we'll discuss that a little later. 5 out of 10 episodes on first viewing, 6.5 on the rewatch. Episode 4 and 5. I'm choosing to group these two episodes together as they go hand in hand and are part of the fearsome womb under heaven arc. Jujutsu Kaisen doesn't usually do too good of a job at naturally connecting the arcs one after the other, causing them to be a rather bit abrupt. But in this case, I think it works. It captures the ominous tone set by the end of the previous episode and does a really good job at making you feel uneasy. The dark atmosphere, prison setting, and ambient rainfall puts in so much work and you immediately can tell that something not can go wrong, but will go wrong. With Goja off on a mission and Jujutsu Tech being so short-staffed, three relatively inexperienced first years are sent to an emergency situation. It's a cruel reality of the world that they're in, and it shows pretty clearly why Jujutsu Sorcerers die young. Nevertheless, the gang takes the mission in stride and they head inside, only to quickly realize that they're in deep, deep trouble. Side note, I love that Yuji and Nobara actually pet the dog. Anytime I see an animal in a game and I don't have the option to pet it, I die a little inside, so it's nice to see those two have such a natural reaction to seeing this little good boy. The inside of the detention center has been taken over by the cursed spirits in complete domain expansion. Check out my barrier video to learn more about this. Knowing what has happened doesn't change the fact that they can't leave from where they once came, and instead have to rely on their good boy to lead them to the exit. It's a tense sequence and the climax with Yuji and Megumi arguing about bringing back the bodies of the killed inmates is so damn good. Yuji is hell-bent on giving people a proper death, and having seen the mother of the deceased cry out for him before entering the center, he doesn't want to turn back and return empty-handed. Megami is more pragmatic. He's been doing this for longer and understands that getting caught up on sentimentality is how most sorcerers end up dead. While he poses a difficult question for Yuji, why bother saving someone who might do more harm than good in the future, Yuji fires back and asks Megami why he chose to save him. The two might be in disagreement, but there is more sentimentality to Megami than he might even admit to, at least in this episode. Gege is really, really good at cramming really interesting character moments and interactions in a very short amount of time. This is incredibly beneficial to a weekly battle shonen format, and while it's something I wish he did much, much more of, it works really well here, as we don't have that much time. This is easily one of the most unsettling panels in the manga, and I'm glad the anime did it justice. The way the two of them immediately freeze up, the beads of sweat, the divine dog's head mounted on the concrete wall, you can really feel that shit is absolutely fucked. Yuji tries to muster the strength to move, but he can't. It's only once he remembers his grandfather's last words, his curse, that he's able to fight back. He swings at the curse, but his hand is already gone along with his blade. Up until this point, Jujutsu Kaisen hasn't been a stranger to violence or a little bit of gore, but something about your main character losing a hand that effortlessly, it sets the tone beautifully. Unwilling to help, Sukuna makes it clear that this will never be an inner demon turns good scenario. From now on until the end of time, Sukuna will be Yuji's number one hater and off. Even after Yuji swaps with him, Sukuna still actively looks for ways to make Yuji's life harder. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Yuji has been doing this for only a brief moment now. Having to face a special grade cursed spirit, unarmed while also unable to even muster up cursed energy, his very ideals are shattered. He's a strong kid, but that 
doesn't mean he isn't terrified of actually dying. Regardless, he musters up the courage to stand back and channels his fear and rage into his fist. In your average shonen, the MC would find the strength here to vanquish the enemy. Jujutsu Kaisen isn't your average shonen. The punch is effortlessly blocked. Simultaneously, a howl from Megumi's other divine dog can be heard, and Yuji swaps the Sukuna, and the cursed spirit is quickly dispatched. What elevates this moment for me is that Sukuna is really, and I mean really committed to being a hater. Not only does he initially just pat the cursed spirit on the shoulder, he actively is thinking of a way to best torture Megumi. The cursed spirit doesn't necessarily comply, so Sukuna makes short work of it using true Jujutsu, domain expansion. It's cool to see domain expansion so early on, given how iconic it's become, and with the special grade gone and his arms healed, all Yuji has to do is switch back. Sukuna waits for a second, calling out to him. Then another. Then another. An expression worth more than a thousand words, the episode ends. Banger back then, banger today. 10 out of 10. Picking up immediately where we left off, Megumi is seen waiting outside for Yuji to return. Nobara has been taken away by Ichiji, and Megumi is left alone. Before he can even finish a thought, Sukuna appears behind him. The expression on Megumi's face immediately tenses up, and beads of sweat trickle down his face. The special grade might have already been a few levels too strong for Megami to handle, but Sukuna is an entirely different beast altogether. To further cement his anti-Yuji agenda, Sukuna rips out his heart, effectively holding Yuji hostage and putting Megami in a pretty bad situation. Okay, I feel like I'm underselling it here. Megami gets walloped. No matter how clean the art and animation is here, which it really is, I mean, look at it, it can't hide how hard Megami gets ragdolled around. Keep in mind, Sukuna has access to his curse technique here, at any point that he grabs hold of Megumi, he could simply cleave him. But being in a good mood, he instead opts to toss him through a few buildings, a feat that was amped a little bit in the anime as it doesn't really happen this way in the manga. While the fight is undeniably cool, what I really want to touch on is the conversation that Sukuna has with Megumi. Instead of just trash talking him, he actually commends Megumi in a roundabout way. Had Megumi not ran and instead fought the special grade, Sukuna seems to believe that he could have won. Keep in mind, this is before Megami even gears up to summon Maharaga, but Sukuna's ability to recognize talent is one that will pay off both in this season and later down the line in the story as well. On Megami's front, we get some golden nuggets of character writing as more is made clear about his morals and just reason for saving people. Tsumiki, Megami's sister, serves as a pillar of hope in his life. She's endlessly kind, and karma, by all means, should have rewarded her. Instead, she now lies in a hospital bed, cursed. His absent father, on the other hand, is out there, potentially living his best life. At least that's what Megumi thinks as of right now. Regardless, Megumi will continue to save good people. Yuji threw himself at almost certain death to save his classmates and a random teenager that he'd never met before. His golden heart reminded Megumi of his sister, and it's ultimately why he asked Gojo to save Yuji. And as he readies himself to summon the Divine General, he stops. Yuji takes control once more, taking his own life before leaving him with the words, live a long life. Okay, elephant in the room time. How and why does the main character die in the fifth episode? Earlier I brought up the ominous setup that Gege hadn't really planned out, and this is what I was talking about. Funnily enough, at this point in time in the manga, Jujutsu Kaisen was not very popular and at real risk of being axed from Shonen Jump. Knowing that his manga might end, you know, only after one volume, Akutami threw in Yuji's death as a way to both add a crazy twist, but also a natural stopping point, should the manga actually get cancelled. While this story is funny in retrospect given just how popular the manga is today, I still think the decision to have Yuji die created a very fun opportunity for Gege to explore other characters. Uh, whether he does that or not is an entirely different story that we'll be getting into. Solid 9 out of 10 back then, still a 9 today. Episode 6 Remember when I shilled my barrier video? The episode opens up with Yuji inside Sukuna's innate domain. The pair isn't dead just yet, all thanks to Megumi impressing Sukuna. Sukuna sees something in Megumi, something important enough to offer Yuji a second chance at life, but not without two conditions. Condition 1. When Sukuna chants the word in chain, he gains full control over Yuji's body for one minute. Condition 2. Yuji forgets this binding vow once he accepts. Naturally, Yuji declines, and Sukuna adds an amendment. While in control, he can't harm anyone. Still not satisfied, Yuji's ready to throw hands once more, and that eagerness doubles when Sukuna offers him a fight to the death. Unfortunately for Yuji, he can't even control cursed energy, and Sukuna's able to cut his head in half with ease. Back in the land of the living, Gojo is happy to see Yuji alive and well, while Ichiji is a little bit more than just surprised. 
Gojo's dream is to uproot the corrupt and conservative society of Jujutsu. While he could go out and kill each and every last one of the leaders, others would simply take over their place, and it wouldn't exactly be a good look either. Instead, he turns to teaching and fostering stronger, smarter, and better allies that can one day stand by his side and truly reset the Jujutsu world for the better. It's an admirable goal, and from a writing perspective, I really dig it. The higher-ups specifically set in motion a plan that would have Yuji very likely die, but now he's back. I didn't talk about Kenjaku and the disaster curses in the last episode, mainly because they kinda leave their conversation halfway, and it actually finishes in the middle of episode 6 instead. Outside of it being a little brutal with how Jogo makes a bunch of normies spontaneously combust, it's cool to see Kenjaku's plan for Gojo being discussed this early on, considering it actually takes effect nearly 100 chapters from now. Another thing I didn't mention last episode, the second years. I don't have anything against them, but I just wanted to maybe illustrate how quickly character introductions and slow periods pass in Jujutsu Kaisen. Season 1 is not nearly as all gas no breaks as the second, but it still blitzes through some aspects that would be more focused on in the average shonen series. Maki, Panda, and Inumaki get introduced, their goals are quickly laid out, and we immediately move on to the next thing. In Hunter x Hunter, Greed Island spends a ton of time fleshing out Gon and Kilua's training, which in turn makes their later fights hit that much harder. While I don't necessarily want or need Jujutsu Kaisen to have a full-on 2-3 episode training arc, I would like to see more of the characters just doing stuff, rather than it being implied and us moving on from it. It's a minor nitpick for this season as I think it does it better than season 2 in the movie, but it's definitely something I think becomes more and more apparent, especially in the currently manga-only material. Regardless, Yuji's learning how to control cursed energy, Megumi has figured something out about his technique, Nobara is being flung around, and Gojo gets ambushed by the one and only... 7 out of 10 back then, still a 7 out of 10. Episode 7. Now this episode, this, this episode is, is fire. Epic. It has everything required for a standout Jujutsu Kaisen episode. Gojo is in it? Check. Good animation? Need I even say? Cool Jujutsu bullshit that's unique to it as a series? Absolutely. Given that most of it is top tier fighting and philosophy bullshit that Gege barely understands himself but still throws in the manga for some reason, I'll shift my focus elsewhere. Being gracious, Jogo is at around 8 or 9 finger Sukuna level. That would make him almost as strong as a 50% Sukuna, assuming the strength of the fingers were constant. Uh, why does this matter? Because Gojo completely drags his face through the dirt, smiling like an absolute maniac throughout. This isn't even a fight, it's a massacre. The point of this scuffle is to highlight the gap in strength between Gojo and Sukuna compared to the rest of the cast. It also serves to show us that the only way Gojo is ever losing is either to the only person potentially as strong as him in Sukuna or getting sealed. It also helps us learn a little more about Jujutsu via Gojo teaching Yuji about domain expansions, probably the most iconic phrase in Jujutsu Kaisen at this point. It's such a baller move to introduce a character like Jogo, who is so much stronger than even the top tier sorcerers we see in Season 2, only to have him get embarrassed by Gojo. He ultimately gets bailed out by Hanami and forced to come back to his boss. 8.725 out of 10 for me. Episode 8 Aoi Toto is one of the best characters in Jujutsu Kaisen. Jokes aside, this relatively normal, exposition heavy episode is amplified and made 10 times better and more chaotic, all thanks to Toto. For fuck's sake, the guy starts the interaction off by ripping his shirt asking Megami what his type of woman is, and then giving his very own, very based answer before we cut to OP. I mean, this had me floored on my first watch, and it gave me a good chuckle this time around as well. While Toto undeniably is framed as a comedic relief character, at least prior to beating Megami's ass, knowing what he's going to say and do this season and the next one makes this interaction all the funnier in retrospect. Toto's question and reaction to Megami's answer is a little out there, but it makes sense given his character. Toto doesn't actually care about Megami's taste on a literal level, whether it's women or men, big rested or otherwise, the answer just need not be boring. And while Megami is being honest when he tells Toto that he has no preference, so long as the person is kind, it also happens to be the worst response. The boring. most boring response. Maya Nobara might be pleased to hear that, but Toto on the other hand, weeps. He calls Megami boring before charging at him and delivering the second most brutal beating that Megami has gotten so far. Don't worry, we've got a few more of those coming. Even if Megami isn't going all out in this fight, Toto isn't either. He gives Megami no opportunities to do anything, up until Megami gears to summon... Maharaga? To be honest, I really doubt that Megami was about to unleash the general against Toto of all people. Given that we see totality being used to fuse the frogs with Nue, try saying that three times fast, I imagine that the divine dog totality was the next summon. 
At this point in time, Megami wants to live and grow stronger because of Yuji's sacrifice, so him dying to kill a friendly sorcerer feels a little out there, even for our favorite suicidal emo teenager. Nonetheless, before he can summon whatever he was summoning, Panda and Inumaki make the save. In retrospect, this scene is kinda hilarious. Panda and Inumaki are made to look super impressive in this arc. Panda knocking Toto back, plus his fight with Mekamaru, while Inumaki gets glazed over and over and over again throughout the exchange event due to the potency of his curse technique. Maki even says at one point that he's on an entirely different level to the rest of them. It's all super funny when you know just how hard they get outclassed by the time Shibuya rolls around, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The situation is diffused, Toto goes to his idol event, and Nobara and Maki share a nice moment. Surely, Gregorius Akutami will spend more time on this friendship, fleshing out their dynamic and making us feel like these characters actually like each other so that when something happens to them, god forbid, in the future we cry out in pain and sadness. Right? Gojo's confrontation with Gakuganji is one I liked on my first watch, but I kinda hate it now. The higher-ups are a joke and continue to be even within the manga-only material. Gakuganji isn't technically one of the higher-ups, but he acts on their orders, so for all intents and purposes, he's their stand-in this season. And while it makes sense that Gojo is practically immune to their bullshit, it's hard to take someone like Akaganchi seriously when he's barely Juzo level. So whenever he's framed so menacingly, I can't help but laugh a little. What is meant to make me laugh, however, and does a good enough job, is Mila's attempt at being serious all the while internally fangirling over Gojo. And the conclusion with her actually getting her selfie is neat. Gojo's such a fun and silly character when it comes to interacting with those around him, so it's a real shame that we don't get to see more of the side of him. The question now is, how does Gege transition from this episode to the next arc? A one month time skip. You see where I'm coming from? Eight and a half back in the day, seven and a half today. Episodes 9, 10, and 11. I don't like Junpei. Smithies, are they booing me? Hold on, hold on, hold on, let me amend that. I didn't really care for Junpei on his own back then, and even now as I'm watching episode 9, I'm not entirely sold on him. While I find his character and art compelling, it just doesn't connect with me on the same level as someone like Nobara or even Nanami. With that being said, Junpei brings with him some of the best material of the season so I can't be all that big of a hater. I love that his current situation mirrors that of Yuji's, whereas compared to him, Junpei's already near the bottom. His friends don't have the same backbone as him, his bullies are evil, and even the adults in his life sit there and let it all happen to him. On the contrary, Yuji was a strong kid surrounded by people that like and encourage him, and even the adults in his school, well, they were a little goofy and Yuji got along with them as well. The role of sorcerer is thrust upon Yuji largely without his consent, Whereas with Junpei, he takes that opportunity in order to exact his revenge. After seeing what Mahito does to his school's bullies, Junpei actively seeks him out. Unaware and unafraid of the most evil curse, he not only follows him, but attempts to learn more from him. By contrast, Yuji follows the light, while Junpei drifts closer and closer to darkness. I love this dichotomy and it's a great setup for their eventual confrontations and the reason why I like that Junpei's in the story. Him on his own though, I'm eh, still not 100% sold on. Episode 9 is also our first introduction to Nanami. A former sorcerer turned salaryman turned sorcerer again, Nanami is easily one of the most interesting and engaging characters of the series, as well as the most relatable in some ways. From his Jujutsu Sorcerers are shit gag, to his design and no-nonsense attitude, it's easy to see why he became a fan favorite so early on. He refuses to acknowledge Yuji as a sorcerer at first, but is still willing to play the role of teacher as the two set out to find Mahito, only to be met by… two… curses. Before fighting them though, Nanami calls Yuji a child and proceeds to drop one of the most real quotes I've heard in a long, long time. You've survived multiple near-death experiences, but that does not make you an adult. Finding more and more stray hairs on your pillow than before, your local store no longer carrying your favorite bread, is the accumulation of such small despairs that turns people into adults. Words to live by. I've steered clear of comparisons between Season 1 and 2, mainly because most people seem to think saying Season 1 does this better than 2 or vice versa is a scathing indictment on whichever one is being criticized, but also because both seasons have different directors, different production schedules, and different teams working on them. Saying outright that one is better than the other is a little foolish. Mini rant aside, I think a big issue that plagued Season 2 was its awful scheduling. Season 1 doesn't seem to suffer from that, at least not nearly as much. This scuffle that Yuji and Nanami get into with Mahito's transfigured humans is a clear-cut example. Even though it's a largely unimportant, low-stakes fight, it's treated with a level of polish that Season 2 couldn't afford to do with its unimportant fights. Whether it be Yuji vs. the Cockroach or Nobara vs. Haruta, this fight in Season 1 clears easily. The direction is incredible with some very creative angles and shots, and the animation itself is stunning. Daniel Baron creates a wonderfully fluid and dynamic first half here, I mean just look at the way the hair flows as well as the clothes and Yuki Yamashita finishes it up with a gnarly fighting game-esque shot. 
Awesome sequence, all in all. With the transfigured humans taken care of, Nanami notices something. These weren't cursed spirits. He contacts Shoko to confirm his suspicions. These are humans. I actually really like this reveal and only wish they'd held off a little longer. Jujutsu Kaisen loves to blitz through its story and this is a time where I think taking some time to focus on this would be beneficial. Yuji is naturally appalled and he only agreed to become a sorcerer so that he could save people from cursed spirits. Even with Shoko reassuring him that they were no longer alive, Yuji is naturally left feeling down. Nonetheless, Nanami proves once again why he's the goat and cheers Yuji up. He gives him the goal of finding Junpei while he goes on a mundane search for the culprit. Unknown to Yuji, however, Nanami knows exactly where to look. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. This is a quote that Junpei has an issue with. Funnily enough, Gege also seems to have a problem with it. In the volume extras, Gege recounts a story wherein his editor informs him that this quote was in fact not said by a Japanese person. If you've only ever seen the anime, this might raise an eyebrow for you. In the manga, Junpei implies that this quote was from a Japanese person. Turns out, it wasn't, and the people in Gege's life have made him painfully aware of this fact. So much so that in the anime version, Junpei actually acknowledges that it wasn't a Japanese person, rather a quote from someone else that has been adopted by the Japanese instead. Does it matter? Eh, not really, but I felt like making fun of Gege for a moment. The origin might not matter, but the meaning behind the quote does as it pretty aptly describes Junpei. At this point, he doesn't really hate people, at least he doesn't want to. He's the one that gets bullied because they hate him. For him to hate someone, it would simply mean that he stoops down to their level. Someone who hates causes pain. Someone who's indifferent doesn't, and that's what humans should strive for. But as we'll see later, Junpei isn't as sold on indifference as he wants to be. Mahito outright predicts this. If only Junpei knew that Mahito's silver tongue was only using him from the start. Elephant curse in the room. Mahito. I haven't really talked about him all that much, but I actually really like his characterization here. Being a young curse, he acts childish, experimenting with his technique only for the sake of figuring out its limits, not out of need to grow stronger, rather morbid curiosity. Or just plain old curiosity to him, I guess. Not only is he teaching Junpei all about sorcery and cursed spirits, but he also imparts his own philosophy to Junpei, a philosophy that is eerily similar to that of the King of Curses, Sukuna. If you're hungry, eat. If you hate, kill. While Yuji's on fine Junpei duty, Nanami takes responsibility as the adult and goes after Mahito on his own. This is another great character moment for Nanami, as in episode 9 he tells Yuji that he isn't an adult. This isn't meant as a way to disparage Yuji, rather it's Nanami understanding the unfair role that's been thrust upon Yuji. It's why he even tells him that it's okay to be childish later on. This mirrors Gojo's sentiment, that of allowing kids like Yuji to live and enjoy the best years of their lives. And it's this idea that- Yeah 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 yeah, enough yapping about this topic, let's talk action. Nanami vs Mahito is the first major fight since Gojo vs Sukuna, and oh boy is it good. Outside of the questionable 3D background textures and compositing in general, this fight is great on every level. Visually it's about what we've come to expect from JJK at this point, and towards the end, channel favorite Keiichiro Watanabe also makes his second appearance. We've got smears, we've got dynamic camera action, we've got Nanami using instant transmission- wait what? Jokes aside, I like this confrontation. Nanami's no-nonsense attitude contrasts really well with Mahito's childlike energy. Mahito taunts Nanami, throws out dead human after dead human, and despite his calm demeanor, Nanami's soul is wavering. He came and prepared to kill as many transfigured humans as it takes, but Nanami's a good man and even he is affected. Using this brief moment of confusion, Mahito is able to land idol transfiguration on him. A few more hits and even Nanami could die. From here on out, Mahito's idol transfiguration is treated with the respect it deserves by Gege, and I cannot commend him more for that. Often you'll see characters with busted techniques slowly get nerfed as their series goes on. Either characters become stronger and resist such abilities, or other stronger counter abilities are introduced. Gege created idol transfiguration with the intention that it remains an almost instant kill ability all the way to Mahito's end and he's stuck to it. Another aspect of the power system that I enjoy is binding vows and the give and take element of Jujutsu. When I first found out that revealing one's technique is a boost in power, and in Nanami's case his overtime, I was truly locked in and ready to call this power system one of the best out there. The idea that Nanami walks around with 80% of his cursed energy output, but as soon as the clock strikes 6 he can go up to 120%, is just so damn cool and I only wish Gege kept at it and gave us more. Hey look, it's Keiichiro Watanabe. What can I say other than this looks amazing? The only letdown is the compositing in the backgrounds, this is an issue that follows the first season around through its entirety, and it really does take away from some of the most impressive cuts of animation throughout. But that's neither here nor there, because we have to talk about… uh, Junpei again. I'm writing the script as I go and I fully expect to shit on Junpei for the entire runtime, or at least that's what I expected. 
Fortunately for him, episode 11 does a really good job at making me at least feel indifferent towards him. Kind of like Carol from The Walking Dead. Why the fuck did she do that? What is wrong with her? Yuji and Junpei share a really nice dynamic. At this point in time, Junpei hasn't been totally plunged into darkness. While he aligns himself with Mahito, Yuji does a great job at showing him that there's good out there, and that all Junpei has to do is learn to lean on and trust people a little more. Seeing his mother have a great time, it puts Junpei at ease, and after having a truthful conversation with Yuji, he's likely ready to give him a chance, just like the opening suggested. He goes to bed that night, peacefully. Yubi? Someone had left one of Sukuna's fingers behind, attracting a curse directly towards Junpei's mother. Naturally, she perishes. Mahito's the first one there, consoling Junpei while simultaneously fanning the fire of hatred within his heart. Junpei is finally submerged in darkness. Who could possibly be so evil as to implant one of Sukuna's fingers and kill an innocent woman? The only person callous enough to do such a thing, at least to Junpei, is the head bully. Not only would he pay, so too would everyone in that forsaken school. Before Junpei can go through with it, Yuji arrives on the scene. 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, uh, 8 and a half out of 10. Episode 12 and 13. Episodes 12 and 13 are where I personally feel like Jujutsu Kaisen finally hits its stride. These episodes are possibly two of my favorites in the entire series, and surprise surprise, they're centered around Yuji. We learn here that Mahito had awakened Junpei's technique by using Idol Transfiguration on his brain, an ability that Kenjaku will find useful in the near future. Armed with the Shikigami control over poison, Junpei lashes out at Yuji. This fight is a hard watch. Junpei has understandably reached his breaking point, with every attack reeking of desperation as he tries to put down Yuji. Understanding that Junpei is in pain, Yuji barely fights back, instead only focusing on reaching Junpei. What has happened to that cheerful kid he'd met just yesterday. It's only when Junpei explodes at Yuji that he realizes something deeper is going on and allows Junpei to pierce his abdomen, showing him that he's willing to hear him out. Have I said how much I love Yuji as a character? Kind shonen protagonists are a dime a dozen, but Yuji manages to feel very grounded and relatable. In the grand scheme of things, he isn't all that strong. Yuji doesn't really know anything about the world that he's been thrown into, and despite this, he can empathize with Junpei's pain and try and help him. He might not understand it, but strong allies and teachers await them at Jujutsu Tech. Kind people that can help Junpei. All he has to do is put a little faith in Yuji. But as he's about to finally walk to the path of light... <gasps> Junpei was naive and trusted the wrong... thing. Just because he and Mahito shared a conversation or two, doesn't change the fact that, to Mahito, all he ever was was a pawn that he could use to try and barter with Sukuna. He puts his arm around Junpei, turning him into a transfigured human, and sending him after Yuji. This scene was a rough watch, and it's simultaneously the reason I didn't like Junpei, but also the reason I liked Junpei? Look, let me try and explain. I love this scene because of how dark, brutal, and helpless it is. It perfectly encapsulates what Jujutsu Kaisen is. There is no hero moment where Yuji will save Junpei, and Junpei won't awaken and fight back, nor will he even continue to live as whatever he is. Hell, he even kills over only a handful of minutes later. It's also why I don't like it though. It's a very grand moment that, once again, I feel like I've been saying this a lot, I wish Gege had taken more time to explore. I think anime-wise, at least another episode where Yuji gets to interact with Junpei would have helped tremendously, because while I do feel bad for Junpei, it's hard for me to connect with the relationship between the two when they've spent one day together. Too long didn't read, Junpei's a solid character, and this is a fitting and dark end for him. I just wish it was a little better though. This next part, this next part's a 10 on the 10. With Junpei transformed to a Pokemon, Yuji's left with no options. No questions asked this time, all he wants from Sukuna is for him to cure Junpei, and just when you think that he'll jump on that opportunity with no strings attached, <laughs> this right here is probably my favorite moment of season 1. Not only is it downright evil, it tells you exactly what Yuji will go through for the entirety of the manga. He's weak, and because of that weakness, people will die. Evil curses like Mahito and Sukuna will continue to haunt him, now and forever. Also, just props to the voice actors in both the sub and dub for this scene. They absolutely nail it, and it's half the reason why I find the scene as good as it is. 10 out of 10. The following episode is all gas. 
Enraged by Junpei's untimely death, Yuji goes ballistic against Mahito. Pain means nothing as he's lacerated and bruised by Mahito's ever-shifting form. Yuji only moves forward, landing blow after blow that, on the surface, seemed ineffective, but his unique situation with Sukuna allows him to directly strike at Mahito's soul, making Yuji Mahito's worst possible matchup. Despite his rage boost, the sheer difference in strength between the two is apparent, and Mahito manages to use Idol Transfiguration on Yuji. Big mistake. Gregory Akutami runs a much tighter ship than people give him credit for. Yuji being weaker than Mahito makes sense. Yuji being his natural enemy makes sense. Yuji being resistant to Mahito's technique because of Sukuna also makes sense. Mahito gets zero diff by Sukuna. That makes sense. Wait, what? In the time that it took me to say that last paragraph, Sukuna had already kicked Mahito away. Not only is Sukuna the strongest in history, his very soul is on an entirely different level altogether. With Nanami having joined the fight, Mahito does his best to separate the two by having Yuji fight transfigured humans, knowing that he lacks a stomach now that he's aware of what they really are. This episode has barely just started and it's already amazing. Yuji's humanity is something that Gege will explore as well as push and pull to its extreme for the rest of time. For now, it's a couple of brainless quarter humans and just look at Yuji's face. On the other front, Mahito is able to overpower Nanami and as he goes in for the kill, with two of them locked in, Mahito receives a beating so brutal, it won't be until Shibuya that we get anything else like it. But, just as the signs of defeat begin to show, fresh inspiration comes with them. <laughs> Mahito's exponential growth has been something Nanami was worried about, and now his fears have become a reality. As viewers, we've seen this same progression. From his experimentation on humans, him learning to set up veils just a little earlier, and his constant growth within this fight itself, Mahito's self-embodiment of perfection was the natural next step and was done justice in the anime. I can't even begin to describe to you just how hard hands are to draw, I mean, go try it. But Hironori Tanaka is just not human, and is able to create this absolutely outstanding cut that features a handful of hands, haha, all in different angles and motions, and it just comes out gorgeous. I love good animation, and this is some great A stuff. Why is it always a sad backstory when a character faces imminent death? Given we know that he survives this, fuck you Gege for the heart attack. Nanami's story for why he even came back to Jujutsu is poignant and fantastic. It paints such a real image of Nanami. He left the Jujutsu world behind and distracted himself with a job that he hated day in and day out. All for money, 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 and more money. With enough money, he could live a life away from curses and other people, but a random act of kindness he does to a bakery clerk reminds him why he even was a sorcerer in the first place. Curses, weak or strong, will continue to exist and make life worse for people. Helping people is why he became a sorcerer, and now it's the reason why he came back. As we learn in Shibuya, if he can foster stronger sorcerers, the mistakes of the past won't repeat, and fewer and fewer young sorcerers will end up the same way as Haibara did. Just as the hands of Mahito's domain close in, Yuji crashes into the domain, putting himself in danger, but also bringing with him true evil. Sukuna is an absolute treat this episode. A line that was missed in the official translations of the manga and dub of the anime, the Buddha saying, throughout heaven and earth, I alone am the honored one, is used to reference Sukuna. A cool detail that I think makes this scene hit that much harder in retrospect, and also makes Gojo's very own version better as well. Having shared a laugh at Yuji's expense earlier, the first transgression from Mahito was easily forgiven. Attempting to touch Sukuna's soul a second time, however... Once again, Mahito's technique is rendered useless, but this time, Sukuna didn't let him off without injury, causing his domain to fall and giving Yuji a chance to counterattack. Despite the opening, Mahito can still make his getaway, and their one good chance at getting rid of him for good is squashed. There's a whole bit with the teacher that was kinda dumb and ignored Junpei's suffering, lecturing the bullies and being all like, I'm gonna be better because of Junpei, and yada yada. But to be honest, <laughs> I just don't really care. These guys are just a bunch of useless summer ants, and the final couple of minutes between Yuji and Nanami are just 10 times more interesting. After having had to kill humans, Yuji's ideal of giving people a proper death has been shaken up. And while Nanami brings up a good point, that trying to give everyone, good or bad, a proper death is exhausting, especially considering that the line between good and evil is blurred in this world, he doesn't tell Yuji not to do it. Instead, he recognizes the kind of person Yuji is and gives him the go-ahead, so long as Yuji makes sure not to die doing so. In this very short arc, Yuji has grown as both a sorcerer and a person, showing Nanami that he's more than just Sukuna's vessel and is someone that ought to be acknowledged. 
short, but effective. 10 out of 10, I've loved this episode every single time I've watched it. Episodes 14 through 18, The Kyoto Sister School Exchange Event, Part 1. The Kyoto Sister School Exchange Event is the longest arc in Jujutsu Kaisen at this point, and while it technically ends with episode 21 in the anime, I want to focus on Toto and Yuji's fight with Hanami in its own section, as well as the, you know, baseball episode. This arc is something that you simply expect if you've ever seen Shonen before. Popularized by the likes of Tagashi and the late Toriyama, tournament arcs are a staple of the Shonen genre, and Greg simply couldn't hold himself from including one in his own story. Tagashi is a master at subverting the tournament arc trope, and it seems like Gege Akutami took some notes. Rather than it being just your average Budokai Tenkaichi style tournament, the exchange event is more of a Fortnite squads game where you're aiming to kill cursed spirits instead of blasting away other teams in combat. Well, at least theoretically. <laughs> the two schools definitely have beef, so fighting between the two is a given. Before any fighting can be done, however, Yuji needs to actually be reintroduced to his friends as alive. Gojo, who by the way is one of the funniest characters in the show, not only with the separation of church and state gag, yes, that would make a viral video, but also with his plan to reveal Yuji's aliveness to the rest of the cast. A grand re-entrance is downright necessary, and Gojo will make sure of that. Okay, maybe it wasn't that grand. To be honest, I fully expected this reaction from Nobara and Megumi, and I'm glad Gege did it this way actually, given that Yuji's reveal was more of a way to slight Gakuganji than it was to surprise the first years. Side note, I love how seriously the anime wants us to take the Kyoto School. I talked a little about Gakuganji, but the Kyoto School, man, you've got them framed as kinda strong, with this rock music accompanying them and the Gurren Lagan style cutouts. Just, ugh, surely, these guys, these guys right here, they're strong, right? I mean, let's just go over where these guys are at as of the end of season two. Mai, fodder, Momo, also fodder, Kamo, fodder, Mekamaru, kind of a goat, but dead. Toto, the goat, but is injured. Miwa, fodder, top of the verse. Yeah, not exactly an inspiring bunch of individuals looking back at them now. But when this was airing and I was watching it for the first time, they looked like they could kind of cook, I guess. Prior to any of the actual fighting, Megumi asks Yuji outright whether something happened to him. Yuji is quick to dismiss Megumi's concerns, but realizing that Megumi sees right through him, he admits that, yeah, something did happen. I love this interaction, and the fact that Megumi, in his own way, is there for Yuji and vice versa, is something that we'll see a lot more of throughout the manga. To make sure I don't spend the next two hours going over each and every single individual episode in painstaking detail, I'll just break them all down to their respective fights. Yuji vs Kyoto School Nothing to really say since it isn't much of a fight. After seeing Toto's outburst earlier at the thought of killing Yuji under Gakuganji's orders, as well as Miwa's hesitation, I didn't really expect them to square up on Yuji. Ultimately, the confrontation doesn't matter since he dodges and weaves their attacks perfectly, and Toto puts a stop to it before it gets any uglier. If only fighting Toto one-on-one -on -one was easier than getting jumped by five other people. Yuji vs Toto I'm just going to say this right now. Just like how Yuji makes pretty much every point in the story more interesting to me, Toto is the other half of that coin. Every single time that Toto has shown up in Season 1, 2, and the movie has had me on the edge of my seat, and this fight? This fight is no different. After making Yuji dumber by a solid 5 IQ points and a Death Note level mind game to find out that Yuji knows his idols, the all-important question is asked, what type of women do you like? The all-important answer to go with it... I like a tall woman with a nice big ass, like Jennifer Lawrence. Now this... This is peak. I mean, what can I say? Toto being so clinically insane that he envisions an entirely new backstory for himself, which, by the way, he will continue to believe for the remainder of the story, it's not even peak, it's peak squared. Let me reiterate, Gege has stated that this only happens because Toto is weird. Yeah, um, it's currently like 6 in the morning and I'm going over the video before I upload it. Uh, there is no Gege saying this at least from what I've found, there's this question here, this answer I mean, but the word weird just isn't used, so... Source? It was revealed to me in a dream. Fuck it, peak cubed. Unwilling to go easy on his best friend since childhood, Toto serves as an excellent teacher for Yuji. Throughout their bout, Yuji continues to impress Toto with everything. From his strength to his agility and quick thinking, Yuji is evolving as a sorcerer in real time. Toto takes this incredibly well, so much so that he's in pure ecstasy as Yuji pummels him. 
But once he lands Divergent Fist, his ultimate move at this point, Toto notices something. While Yuji may have the raw strength and talent, he's being capped by his lack of knowledge. We can blame Gojo for that one. Divergent Fist is a great move for Yuji both thematically and story-wise. It represents his innate physical prowess rivaling that of Maki's Heavenly Restriction, while also showcasing his lack of knowledge in Jujutsu due to him being thrown into the world without warning only a couple months prior. The move might allow him to reach the heights of a stronger than average sorcerer, but to reach the realm of the truly strong, he needs Toto's guidance. How can you not love this fight and this brotherly duo as a whole? Maki vs Miwa Short and sweet, this is a wonderfully animated bout that showcases Maki's overwhelming physical prowess. Miwa also has a great showing. Kind of. I, I love that she acknowledges her uselessness and her reasons for becoming a sorcerer in the first place are so real, kind of like Nanami. What I found most compelling here is actually Maki's ranking as a sorcerer in relation to her skill level, which Miwa makes a note of. She effortlessly weaves around the polearm in cramped areas, is resourceful enough to break her weapon in half to create an opening, and also a monster in close quarters. Yet she remains in grade 4 as part of her misfortune in being a Zenin. Surely we'll get a lot more of information and focus on the Zenin clan and Gargoyle Akutami won't have them show up only for a brief moment here and there, right? Right? Maki vs Mai This one isn't much of a fight. Mai is just outclassed in every single way. Despite having a cursed technique and second amendment rights, Maki beats her without much difficulty. Even the secret 7th bullet in her 6th shooter gets blocked. Mai vs Maki was never meant to be a flashy fight. It still is because the talent that worked on JJK is absolutely bonkers, but the real fight is the emotional one. As we find out more about Maki and Mai's past, her hatred for Maki begins to make a little more sense. Mai's hatred toward her sister isn't a rational one, but I don't think it's one directed at Maki personally. I'm cheating a little here by looking into the future of the manga to confirm, but what Mai hated was Maki's actions and the role that was forced upon her because of it. Being born as women in the Zenin clan with no inherited techniques practically sealed their fate. The only options were to either live within the clan, performing chores and other duties, or to leave, being ever tormented by the chokehold the Zenin have in the Jujutsu world. Maki made her choice, a choice that was true to herself. Her constant thirst for growth as a sorcerer and desire to stick it to the Zenin clan meant that Mai had to follow suit. But Mai can't be like Maki, and her weakness and desire to remain at the bottom is at odds with Maki's, causing Mai to resent her sister, but again, Maybe I'd be cheating if I said a little more. I also just love the imagery for their first flashback here, and the moment of the twins crossing the bridge with Maki leading the way as she can't see curses is incredibly powerful. After all, if you can't see them, they might as well not even be there. Panda vs Mekamaru In all honesty, I did not expect to like Panda this much. From what I remembered, he was an alright character. I mean, he's a panda. But man oh man, is he great. He's got some of the most consistently funny lines, his punch rush is a direct reference to JoJo's, and oh my god, he literally ass blasts Mekamaru at one point. Don't even get me started on the coolest part. Panda is not a panda. I mean, this is just so clever by Gege. Panda being, well, panda, is something that is told to us over and over and over again. It's even in his character introduction extra. So to flip that on its head and reveal that it's actually a panda and two not pandas is such a fun twist that also gives panda a wide arsenal of interesting moves. From the balanced stand rushing panda form to his goblin gorilla mode that does internal damage, this fight is surprisingly well done. Visually it's about on par with a previous one, but the added abilities that Mekamaru has allow for some really cool effects work that just looks fantastic. Speaking of Mekamaru, Mekamaru stole the show for me here. I must have made the joke that his voice actor plays the role so well you'd think his rent is due the next day, but man, he must have been 200,000 yen in debt to Lone Shark since day one because Yoshitsugu Matsuoka really puts on a show here as well. Matsuoka, you are not in Dragon Ball, you can relax. It is a solid fight all in all, and having Panda be the one that helps Mekamaru get out of his cursed corpse racism phase was a great choice. Not Panda is actually a panda, so the ways in which humans act around each other doesn't really compute with him. All Panda wants to do is get along with Mekamaru and meet up with the real one. And when Mekamaru tries to push him away one last time, Panda makes it pretty clear. He's just a panda bro, it ain't that serious. This is what makes tournament arcs so enjoyable and why they've become a popular trope. The matchups that are chosen aren't and shouldn't be done at random. Goku vs Piccolo Jr. Gon versus I forgot to fucking write his name down. Oh my god, what was his name? Gon versus Hanzo. Naruto versus Neji. Every single one of these fights has a story to tell, and putting two characters that are at odds with one another is a great way of creating an exciting and fulfilling match. Panda is a cursed corpse, able to walk around and enjoy life, while Mikamaru is a human that's been forced into a life he doesn't want. 
confined to a basement for the rest of his life, unable to spend any time with the people he holds dear. His resentment towards Panda makes sense, but at the end of the day, his shitty situation doesn't give him carte blanche to be this much of a dickhead, especially towards people or pandas that are on his side. Panda wins the physical fight, symbolizing that he also won the exchange of ideals as well. Nobara vs Momo. Probably, and possibly, the most underwhelming fight of the series so far, Momo kinda sucks. And Nobara being worried about branches and rocks being flung at her is insane when you consider what Panda just withstood a few minutes ago. Thankfully, Nobara's speech and subsequent squeaky hammer bit saved the fight for me. When this episode dropped, I think the entire anime fandom watched it and could agree on one thing. It was cool that a female character like Nobara existed. Where are they all now? Megumi vs Noritoshi. Oh look, a fight where a ton of cool lore is hinted at with the Zenin and Kamo clan. Surely Gaddafi Akutami will delve into the eternal politics of the Jujutsu world, thus giving an easy way for Kamo to be naturally included in the story going forward. Right? Jokes aside, well, not really jokes, but this fight is alright. I like that the Jujutsu techniques felt a lot more grounded up to this point, I mean barring Gojo and the rest of the top tiers of course. Like all Kamo does here is jack himself up with performance enhancers, and I remember being like, damn, that's actually so cool. Oh how naive I was. They don't really get the chance to fight all that much, nor do they show off their strongest techniques as their fight gets cut short by Hanami. It was an alright exchange I guess. Now Hanami, Hanami is cool. First of all, never forget that Inumaki pet the dog, what a goat, but more importantly, Hanami's presence in this arc is what continues to elevate it. Unlike Jogo or Mahito, Hanami has this weird, eerie aura to... Her? It? Zem? We barely know anything about Hanami, leaving even us viewers to guess what their intentions and abilities even are. Also, when Gojo calls himself Great Teacher Gojo, I have no doubt that this is in reference to Great Teacher Onizuka. Fun fact, Geke's favorite anime OP is GTO's second OP, Hitori no Yoru. Side note, look at the way Kama reacts to Megumi and Minamaki talking to each other, by the way. Yeah, me too, buddy. Episode 19 and 20. These are two of the big ones this season. Keichiro Watanabe, please fuck off, I'll talk about your contributions in a minute. Picking off exactly where we last left off, the ragtag team of Megumi, Inumaki, and Kamo are shit out of luck. A veil has been cast that keeps away the one get out of jail free card that they've gotten Gojo, and Megumi's iPhone XS Max gets dusted before he can even dial Gojo. The combination of Megumi and Kamo's attacks can't do so much as scratch Hanami, leaving it all up to Bonito Flakes himself. So far into the event, Inumaki has barely gotten to show any of his strength. His mere existence is a constant threat to the Kyoto school. Hanami, on the other hand, doesn't feel that same pressure. Even a three-way combo isn't enough, as Inumaki's throat gives in first. What do you mean by that? Cursed speech is incredibly effective against cursed spirits, but when the cursed spirit is an order of magnitude stronger than you, it doesn't take much for Inumaki's throat to get tired. Who the fuck wrote? Without any allies or options left, Megami gears up to summon. Okay, yeah, it's Maharaga this time. I'm not even gonna try and come up with an alternative. But before he can complete his sewer, sorry, sewer slide, unaliving. Before Megami can pull a Megami, Maki makes the save and alongside Playful Cloud the two begin making some actual progress. In Maki's hands, the staff does actually a lot of damage, taking a chunk out of Hanami's hand, and I don't know whether this is Gilbert Akutami being a foreshadowing goat or just coincidence, but in the next episode, Toto imbues his maximum cursed energy into the staff and aims for Hanami's weak spot. The attack does noticeably less damage despite it being a more tired and weakened Hanami, and the reason I bring this up is because Playful Cloud is the one cursed tool that scales with raw physical strength rather than cursed energy, and it's why Toji makes the most use out of it compared to anyone else. Just a tiny observation. Even with Megami's new and improved dog as well as Maki's physicals, Hanami proves too much for the two. They're in real danger of dying, but Yuji and Toto make their grand entrance. Yuji vs Hanami. This is where Yuji lands his first Black Flash. Spoilers. I think Black Flash is one of the coolest moves in JJK, specifically because of it mostly being a luck thing that can be done by anyone, good or bad. And it's this principle that Giga has kept pretty consistent throughout the story. Yuji's unable to use it at first due to his mind wandering and his emotions being all over the place because of Junpei, but a slap in the face from best brother Toto and a small pep talk later, and Yuji is in full focus mode and is able to finally land it. I love the cooking analogy Toto uses here, and he continues to prove why he's one of the goats in the show. Crazy to think that this was only the beginning. Yuji and Toto vs Hanami. Jumping is defined as to attack or pounce upon without warning, as from ambush. The act of jumping an enemy is a Jujutsu Kaisen special, and I can count on one finger another fight in the series that can match the jumping received by Hanami in these two episodes. Yuji and Toto vs Hanami is probably the fight that put Jujutsu Kaisen on the map, and it's not a surprise that a full feature length movie and second season later, it remains as a top contender for best fight among fans. 
It's got stunning animation, great choreography in its hand-to-hand -hand scenes, the camera work is splendid, and even the more aesthetic moments are a treat to watch. Keichiro Watanabe heads us off with undoubtedly one of his most popular cuts, and the only issue with all of his cuts this season is the less than good compositing and backgrounds that accompany it. His drawings all tend to be super loose and fluid, which when backed by a background with washy textures, a lot of the polish in his animation can get lost. This doesn't make his cut specifically any less amazing, I mean just look at it, but it's a glaring issue with season 1 that I think is most noticeable in this episode. The water effects look bad, the background here is literally a plane with god knows what going on there, and I mean just look at some of the wood textures on Hanami's branches and throughout. Thankfully, the rest of the underlying aspects of the fight more than make up for it. For starters, Yuji finally calls Toto his brother, Peak, but also Mahito and Hanami have a discussion that in retrospect, perfectly illustrates and foreshadows what Mahito will become in Shibuya. He tells Hanami to rely more on instinct, the instinct of a curse to kill. This manifested Mahito fully understanding the true shape of his soul in Shibuya, and for Hanami, enjoyment and fulfillment in battle never felt before. Boogie Woogie is top tier. Top tier in what? Literally everything. The name, the activation, the ability itself. Swapping abilities in Shonen tend to feel either underutilized or too overpowered to the point they get written off, one way or another. Boogie Woogie I think strikes a really good balance at making it strong, but also fair. Toto spams the ever-living shit out of it, but it doesn't stop Hanami from adapting. There's clear rules and conditions, but Toto omits them in a clever way that works out 10 times better for Jujutsu Kaisen than it ever could in another series. With abilities getting buffs when explained, Toto revealing his hand to Hanami early is what allows the later bluffs to work flawlessly. Hanami assumes that Toto is telling the truth, and he is, but by virtue of being truthful, he's also being deceitful. It's such a great twist on the technique that makes it feel truly unique, despite it being a wildly popular choice for the shonen genre. If all Toto had was Boogie Woogie, I think it would make for a pretty lame reveal. Thank god Toto also happens to be the smartest character in the show to boot. The 530,000 IQ galaxy brain that he possesses is a funny gag, but the fact that he can actually back it all up is what really seals the deal. Toto's analytical ability is in such stark contrast to his looks and a subversion that makes him all the more interesting. And don't get me started on his meth-induced dream sequence where he figures out the weakness of Hanami's curse buds. It's downright ridiculous, but so on brand at this point that just like JoJo's, I've never once questioned it. What I have questioned, however, is who the hell is asking Nanami about his Black Flash record and then relaying it to us. I know canonically it's Ino, but the fact that Gege is such a Togashi fanboy and that he'd reference Hunter x Hunter so brazenly is commendable. I've always found this trope very fun. It adds a certain charm and hype to any given sequence that's different from a simple narration. Regardless, Nanami's record of four consecutive black flashes is tied by Yuji as he tears into Hanami, a sight that has Toto tear up, reminding him of the other time that his boredom got flipped on his head. The time he met special great sorcerer Yuki Tsukumo. Surely we'll learn more about Toto and Yuki's dynamic in time together. Gege isn't the type to off screen that, right? Back against the trees? Hanami charges up. Toto's technique is troublesome, but there is a way around it. Domain expand. This was straight up divine when the episode dropped and had everyone on Twitter buzzing about it. But to be honest, with Hidden Inventory making Gojo's Purple the cinematic masterpiece that it is, going back to this mess of 3D effects that kinda meshed together was a little tough. Nonetheless, the day is saved, and all that the school lost was a handful of Sukuna's fingers. Surely there won't be irreparable damage caused by them in the future. 10 out of 10, easily, both times. I feel like this goes without saying. Episode 21. Filler episode. I repeat, filler episode. Okay, but not really. This is actually one of the most fun to watch episodes, and I've been looking forward to it since the start of my rewatch. I love the inherent goofiness in it, and it really gives off that same energy as the Dragon Ball driving episode. What, you thought I'd compare it to the readily available and more fitting baseball episode from Dragon Ball Super? Well, Super sucks donkey dick. The first quarter isn't filler at all as it mainly focuses on Kenjaku's plan regarding Gojo and Sukuna. Hanami also almost gets done in by number one Michael Jackson fan Haruta, which is downright embarrassing. Hanami, lock the fuck in, my guy. Back at the school, everyone has been debriefed on the situation and asked whether the event should even continue. Toto actually has some real words of wisdom that betray his age, but do a good job at hammering home that this ridiculous gorilla who thinks he went to school with Yuji, even though the two of them had just recently met, is somehow very smart and well-spoken. And with Gojo not being a fan of the mundane and repetitive nature of Goodwill events of Christmas past, puts his hand on the scale and the schools end up having to play baseball. The episode might seem fillery, but it actually gets called back to in episode 23, and is a really nice bit of writing on Gege's part. The central person to focus on here isn't actually Yuji, 
Rather, it's Megami. During the baseball match, Megami does everything within his power to make sure that his teammates succeed in getting their runs. He bunts the ball instead of swinging for the fences, and Gojo notices. It's a brilliant but small piece of writing that shapes who Megami is as a character for the remainder of the series thus far. The rest of the episode is hilarious with some of my favorite gags both visually and otherwise. The flavor text, for example, is so underappreciated. Miwa was saving a mango, only to have it stolen by someone. A little later do we find out that Mai had just recently started liking mangoes. Panda <laughs> wants to punch a fucking zebra, how is that not the funniest thing ever? And Toto's delusions follow descriptions as well, with him and Yuji having made it to the nationals, but Itadori denies this. Who the fuck is asking them these questions by the way? And man, Toto getting knocked out by Maki's pitch, only for everyone, and I mean everyone. Laugh at his misfortune is comedy gold. Even Megami's divine dog can be heard barking alongside everyone. A great and necessary episode that helps us unwind from the incredibly gloomy and intense episodes of past. I only wish Jujutsu Kaisen did this more often. 8.5 out of 10. Episodes 22, 23, and 24. Once again, we abruptly jump from one arc to the other. This time around though, I don't really mind it since it's the gang going on their first group mission since the detention center. This three episode stretch is incredibly strong and features some of the best elements of JJK here and for the foreseeable future. So apologies in advance for the Kenjaku tier yapping session that awaits you. This last three episode stretch, to me, feels like what Jujutsu Kaisen is at its best. The main trio is present, the cursed spirits are the main threat, the stakes feel high, and the dynamic between Yuji, Nobara, and Megumi is at its peak. These guys have so, so much chemistry together, and it's a shame that this will be the last time that they all work together. I understand that there's a tonal shift in Shibuya, and that plays a huge part in its enjoyment for me, but I do believe that Jujutsu Kaisen, as I've said many times throughout this review, could have and could still benefit from arcs like this. Off rip, the humor in episode 22 is a step up from the previous ones, mainly because of Yuji and Nobara. The two are such a thorn in Megumi's side, and Nobara's refusal to learn these guys' names and resorting to calling them A and B is so well delivered in the anime, which makes me kind of sad that I didn't talk so much about the just absolute stellar performances from the Japanese VAs. Um, if I started talking about everyone from Sukuna to Mekamaru to Yuji Nobara, I've mentioned all these little by little, but man, if I just spent time on each and every single one of them, we would really be here all day. Now, if instead you'd ask me to talk about what even this episode was all about, prior to me rewatching the show, I think this portion would be maybe one sentence long. All I could remember is that, at some point, there's a shot of Megami sitting atop of a mountain of people that he beat up. In fairness, I wasn't missing much story-wise, there's a curse that's killing off people who bungee jump this one bridge, and the gang has to scooby dooby solve that mystery. Oh yeah, did I mention that Megami's sister went to the bridge at some point and is now bedridden, cursed with, and likely to die? Oops, my bad. The situation has completely changed, and something must be done ASAP. Wanting to resolve the matter himself, Megami sends Yuji and Nobara away as he heads to the bridge. Despite them having been there earlier in the day and nothing having happened, Megami figures out the requirements for the curse to trigger. Fully expecting to do it alone, he doesn't even notice Nobara and Yuji sneak up on him. Again, these guys have really good chemistry. They understand Megami fully and will support him no matter what. And when he does feel like sharing whatever is bothering him, they'll be there to listen as well. I love, love, love this trio so much. Surely, Genghis Akutami will continue to further develop. The Cursed Spirit is a... whack-a-mole. While annoying, it seems all too easy. Until Kechizu and Esso decide to show up, forcing Nobara and Yuji outside the barrier and leaving Megami alone against the mole. Megami versus Mole. Megami effortlessly wins. What? I know the meme is that Megami is a bum, but... Come on guys, have a little bit more faith in him than that. Megami vs Special Grade 2, Electric Boogaloo. You'd think that with a name that means blessings, Megami wouldn't manage to draw the short end of the stick every single time, right? Given how outclassed he was the first time around against the Finger Bearer, if you had any hope for him when you first watched the show, I commend you. This Finger Bearer is much stronger than the first, and while Megami is able to block and dodge for a while, the gap in power is just so large that he gets knocked straight into a flashback. When I said that the baseball episode was important, this is what I meant. Megami's decision to bunt the ball is one that can make sense and might even seem noble, but in the world of Jujutsu, sometimes being selfish is the correct move. Gojo and Yuji are characters who always swing for the fences, facing each challenge head on. Yuji quite literally hits a home run, so I don't know how much clearer a picture Gege could paint. Megami, on the other hand, is too timid. So long as he's got Maharaga under his sleeve, he doesn't really need to ever be selfish and rely on his own strength. Opponent too strong, Summon Maharaga. Opponent too weak, 
Summon Maharaga. Stubbed your toe on the same corner one, three, seven too many times. Maharaga. So long as Megami tries to win by dying, he will never reach the heights of Satoru Gojo. Sukuna likely saw something similar in Megami. His technique is powerful and he has the talent, so why did he run away from an inferior opponent? It's only after these words circle Megami's mind that he finally understands. Maharaga pose no longer shall be his default state of being. It's time to truly jujutsu that Kaisen. The culmination of Megami's character arc this season, an incomplete domain brought about at the brink of death, Megami unleashes 120% of his curse technique in a scene that was more than done justice in the anime. The music choice has been very strong this season when it comes to its big moments, and here it's no different. The triumphant music swelling as Megami continues to land blow after blow, he gets taken out but it's just a shadow clone. Nui circle and relentlessly attack the finger bear, and when he's had enough and blasts the domain away, assured of his victory, Divine Dog Totality is ready to pounce right behind it. The Finger Bearer is vanquished, and the growth that we knew Megami was capable of has come full circle. The rest of the episode centers around Megami and his relationship with Sumiki. This flashback also recontextualizes a few things about Megami, which I find pretty cool. Old Megami would have probably summoned Maharaga on Yuji in episode 1 without a second thought. Sumiki's unyielding kindness was something that Megami used to loathe her for, but only once she was cursed did he begin to realize how foolish and immature he was being. Seeing Yuji fearlessly sacrifice himself over and over again because of his pure heart moved Megami. And that's a direct result of Tsumiki's influence on him. Megami wants to save Tsumiki, but he can't. Even after the Finger Bearer curse is defeated, the curse upon Tsumiki remains, and Megami passes out from exhaustion. Tsumiki's impact on Megami is something so important that I really need you guys to keep in mind going forward. Given that it's manga only material, I won't go into super detail, but it's crazy to me that the slander Megami receives, given his relationship with his sister, this is in big part Gege's fault as he seems to be allergic to spending a little bit more time on character interactions, but there's still enough there for people to at least think more critically. I fully didn't expect to like this part of the episode as much as I did, but with the added context from being a manga reader, this here is downright tragic. Yuji and Nobara vs Kechisu and Esso During episode 3, I said I'd cover Nobara a little later. It's now later. This is by far Nobara's best and most impressive performance to date, and likely the reason she had so much hype and hope going for her when season 2 got announced. The first mission that Team 7, Yuji, Nobara, and Megumi take on has them completely outclassed and traumatized. By the end of the season, their growth is outwardly shown by Megumi dusting the stronger finger bearer, with Yuji and Nobara both beating two special grades in Esso and Kechisu. Esso even has a maximum technique for some reason. Keep in mind, even currently, only like four other characters have been shown to have one, so these two brothers were clearly not fodder, and I think that helps Nobara's rep a little bit. The fight itself is baller. Yuji and Nobara start off on the back foot and the two go on the run. With Yuji being physically much faster, he picks her up to get the hell out of dodge as she watches his six. Again, their dynamic is just so good together. Nobara is written as a very competent character, and just because Yuji is the one to get them out of there, it doesn't diminish her potential for impact, let alone what she's about to do to both brothers. But get this, it's about to get even better. Songu Park himself directed and worked on this episode, helping deliver one of the best and most memorable cuts of the season. It's dynamic, it's creative, and each and every punch has weight to it. And as if having the director personally come in wasn't enough, Keiichiro Wata for fu- And as if having the director personally come in wasn't enough, Keiichiro Watanabe teams up with Koki Fujimoto to coke. Okay, I'm sorry, never again. These two create one of the most satisfying sequences of the entire season, Yuji and Nobara's Black Flash. This right here was beautiful. Not just visually, but also for what it meant in regards to Nobara. Hitting a Black Flash is what separates the truly strong from everyone else. Having Nobara go from twig level to hitting a Black Flash is a great progression for her, and given the technique that she has, this was the only power-up she needed to logically stand shoulder to shoulder with Megumi and Yuji going into Shibuya. Given what happens to her in Season 2, I still don't think that changes any of my feelings towards this scene in particular, and the ruthlessness with which she brings down Kechisu is a treat to watch. Her choosing to play a game of chicken, betting her life on the line, remains to this day as one of the rawest moments in the series. First Megumi, and now Nobara, both have undeniably villainous looks about them this arc. In Nobara's case though, it might not be so far off. Instead of turning to dust like a regular cursed spirit, Kechizu's body remains. Esso and Kechizu are whatever characters. They make their appearance at the end of the show and die there. On a rewatch after Shibuya, it's not so black and white. Esso crying for his brother leaves a much stronger impression now that we know a few things. One, Yuji's related to the two of them. Two, they didn't choose to be born like this and were pawns in Kenjaku's plan. Three, their backstory and relationship to Kenjaku, which I guess could be point two, never mind. And number four, almost as important as point one, Choso is related to them. This 
won't really matter as much as far as Season 2 is concerned, but because of the manga, Choso very quickly becomes one of my favorite characters. Not only does Esso crying leave a strong impression on me, Yuji himself is devastated, so much so that when he goes in for his final attack, a narration from Nanami can be heard. Once they land a Black Flash, sorcerers temporarily enter a state athletes call the Zone. Yuji goes for a punch, apologizing in the heat of battle. As his fist connects, the sparks of black don't follow behind it. It hurts. This is brilliant. Yuji isn't hurting only physically, but as we'll see in a little bit, he's also hurting emotionally. Having Black Flash not trigger because of his focus being all over the place is a really good show-don't-tell, and I can't believe I missed it on my first watch. After the dust has settled, rather than it being a triumphant victory lap, the mood is noticeably soured. Nobara is handling the news much better than Yuji, and it really highlights the differences between the two. Even though Yuji is the stronger sorcerer, Nobara has an aptitude for it that Yuji lacks. It's here where she opens up to Yuji about herself and the mindset that allows Nobara to be way more calm and collected. I've gone over this in much more detail during my Shibuya review, but Nobara only has a handful of seats in her life. This is a metaphor for the amount of people that she's willing to actually care for. With there only being a limited number, she chooses very carefully who she lets in. People like Yuji, on the other hand, crash in almost uninvited and help themselves to a seat. And because there's only so many of these seats, anyone not included barely matters. It's a little jaded and kind of psychotic when you consider that she uses it as a way to mercilessly kill Esso and Kechisu, but it's powerful imagery and I've enjoyed it no matter the number of times I've rewatched or reread the series. Conversely, Yuji isn't holding up well. He's already had to kill more humans than a 15 year old ought to, and their deaths still weigh heavy on his mind. His conviction had been to save people, or at the very least give them a proper death. Transfigured humans or cursed objects just hadn't given him that option. Although it always heavy on his mind, Nobara does a pretty good job consoling him, claiming that the two are accomplices, and together they go find Megami. I won't even make my now overused Gege joke, this was really sweet and makes what happens to Yuji and Nobara in season 2 all that more painful. The rest of the episode focuses on the aftermath. Megami doesn't want Yuji to know that Sukuna's fingers are resonating, likely causing all this death around them. Nobara agrees to not tell him, but don't worry, Sukuna has that covered. Needing to get one last shot in before the season ends, he taunts Yuji about his goal to save people. So long as he harbors Sukuna, all those people that he wants to save will be in constant danger, and trust me, we'll see plenty of that in season 2. I mean, we've technically seen it by now, but you get what I'm saying. I've talked about Sukuna being the one true hater, and Gege seems to be in agreement. Sukuna and Yuji will never see eye to eyes, and working together, Ninetales style is less likely than Boogie2988 having cancer. <laughs> After Toto and Mei Mei recommend Maki, Panda, fucking Panda by the way, how did he get in there? Megumi, Nobara, and brother Yuji for grade 1, we cut to the three of them talking about a mission. I wonder if this mission that Megumi mentions is the same one that he talks about at the end of Hidden Inventory when they're all in Gojo's office. For the sake of the video, I'm gonna pretend it is, so roll with it. Megumi's phone buzzes, it's Gojo. A new top secret mission that they must undertake, where the previous ones were shrouded in dread and darkness. This one will be better. Megumi, Nobara, and Yuji have become stronger, and it's finally time for a new dawn. When I jumped on this rewatch, I wasn't exactly sure what to expect. Jujutsu Kaisen is rewatchable, sure, but I didn't think it would ever match something like Attack on Titan. And it doesn't, don't get me wrong. But that isn't to say that Gege Akutami doesn't have a concrete vision for the story. On the contrary, this rewatch has shown me that, for all the criticisms, fair and unfair, Gege does know, at the very least, what he's doing, and this has me excited for the remainder that the series as a whole has. I wholly recommend you watch not just this season, but both the next and the movie. And if you want to hear more from me, check out the Hidden Inventory and Shibuya Arc reviews. Thank you for watching.